If you've ever engaged with the literary criticism space in any sort of action-heavy genres, you've probably heard the term plot armor. Plot armor is a phenomenon where a character's narrative importance and centralization in the plot provides them with a sometimes implausible level of protection against things that would easily maim or kill a side character. Plot armor might let a main character walk off anything from a bullet to a building exploding, because the purpose of these threats in story is not to kill the protagonist, it's to challenge them, to increase the tension and or leave them vulnerable in interesting ways. Essentially, it doesn't matter how realistic deadly or damaging a hit should be, if they're a main character who needs to continue participating in the plot, they're not gonna get one-shotted. And plot armor doesn't just keep characters alive, it also keeps them active so they can continue to participate in the story and move the plot along. Even a non-lethal injury can dramatically slow the plot down, and there's a difference between a protagonist staggering out of a car crash with a limp and a protagonist spending two months recovering in a hospital and then another six weeks in physical therapy. Plot armor mostly gets focused when it's being called out as a problem or a symptom of weak writing, but it's basically just a facet of suspension of disbelief belief, where the audience is expected to understand that a story randomly killing off a main character on whom much of the plot is dependent will probably severely impact that story's effectiveness. When we suspend our disbelief, we accept that sometimes the story makes the plot better by doing things that don't 100% make sense. But plot armor isn't the only factor that shapes how resilient the characters are. After all, plot armor is for important characters only, and does absolutely nothing to protect side characters, background extras, a main character's beloved extended family, etc. But even without the protection of plot armor, background characters in one one story might walk off the kind of damage that would have fully exploded them in another. In one story, it might be unthinkable to ever see visible blood, while in another, it might be impossible for a character to get through a grocery trip without getting doused in three pints of the stuff. This is a phenomenon that I've taken to calling tone armor. Through every genre and every form of media, every story sets a tone. Now, tone is a deceptively massive concept influenced by a ton of factors, and because it's basically another word for vibes, we're not going to be able to nail down a rigid set of rules for defining it. It's shaped by the feel of the dialogue, the emotional range of the characters, the density of jokes, the musical score, the ambient lighting and color grading, the statements it makes on human nature, the character choices it rewards or punishes, the tone of the story is the sum of a massive number of parts. In a way, it's kind of like the temperature of a room. A lot of factors are influencing it, but you're basically only going to notice it if it makes you uncomfortable or if it's changing rapidly. And the thing is, the tone of a story does fluctuate, sometimes significantly. Some stories get progressively more mature and dark over time. Some go from episodic, disconnected adventures to overarching grand-scale threats. Many games let their narrative stakes escalate alongside the protagonist's power scaling. Some shows have notably dark episodes that are memorably scarring, and there's a whole set of tropes based around a story hitting unexpectedly hard by taking a turn that's outside the current scope of the expected tone. If you want to look into some of those tropes, a lot of them are bundled under the Cerebus Syndrome umbrella, which describes stories that establish a relatively lighthearted tone and then take an unexpected turn into extremely dark directions. It's rare for stories to go the other way, except in the sense that dark stories can have happy happy endings, but I'm sure it's happened somewhere. The thing is, deviating from a story's established tone is a powerful tool. If a story never shows blood, even a single visible drop can be immensely impactful. But in order to get the power from breaking those rules, the rules need to be solidly established first. And with something as vibes-based as tone, those rules are set down subtly. The tone of the story gives the audience an expected range of what kinds of things can or can't happen. This can range in scale from good will always triumph in the end and heroic intentions will be rewarded because this is a story about good people being vindicated, to just whether or not characters can swear more than once a movie. The tone of a story is kind of a soft-edged probability map of what kinds of things can be expected to happen in the story versus what kinds of things are quite unlikely. In classic heroic fantasy, the tone makes things like good guys win in the end fairly likely, and protagonist randomly takes an arrow to the face halfway through rather unlikely. In a zombie apocalypse, the tone makes a happy ending for all main characters catastrophically unlikely, but it's also pretty unlikely that the main character is gonna die to anything other than a zombie bite, since the tone typically centralizes that as the core of the underlying horror and anything else would be almost a letdown. Although, if it's a zombie apocalypse where the tone is more broadly nihilistic, the main characters can theoretically die from anything, since meaningless random cruelty serves the tone. If anything, the most unlikely outcome in a zombie apocalypse is anyone behaving like a decent human being. In an episode of Scooby-Doo, the tone forecast suggests a surfeit of wacky shenanigans and traps, but it's very unlikely that we're gonna see Shaggy throw out his back from carrying 140 pounds. Great Dane. Realistically, none of these unlikely events are actually impossible, they just don't fit the vibes, and thus the characters are invisibly protected from them, a kind of armor that they acquire from the tone. A story that takes a comedic, cartoony tone will likely play fast and loose with the laws of physics, and the characters will correspondingly be extremely sturdy. A character face to face with a bomb will be reduced to an ash pile with two blinking eyes. A character that gets shot with a gun will have their duck bill cartoonishly spin around their face. A character careening off a cliff will explode, and 
then be back one scene later. In this established tonal context, it would be extremely jarring for a character to get hit with a mallet and consequently be hospitalized with a brain injury, or even for a character to get a paper cut and visibly bleed. The tone of the story doesn't allow for it. This is tone armor, the set of assumptions and standards that a story's tone establishes specifically in the context of endangering the characters. Despite what the cartoonish example might imply, tone armor is not actually a case of more realism equals darker story equals nastier injuries. For one thing, humans in real life are deceptively durable and capable of surviving some pretty bananas things, but in, for example, sword and sorcery fantasy, the heroes might swing their way through an army of minions and take them all down permanently with one sword stroker light stab each. This is a combo of plot and tone armor, where the bad guy's status as faceless side characters affords them negative plot armor and lets a stiff breeze knock them over for convenience of pacing. But it's also tone armor, because a hero bloodlessly dancing their way through an army of goons is quick and clean and exciting to watch, and it spares us from watching any slow or icky consequences to that kind of combat. We don't see those stricken minions slowly and horrifically die in a field hospital like we'd expect from the tone of a tragic war movie, and we also don't typically see half of those minions stand up again with minor scratches on their sturdy leather armor ready for another go like we might expect from real life. In this case, tone armor dictates that faceless minions basically get one hit point each, and when they're hit, they're cleanly down forever, which is not innately realistic. It just makes for good fight choreography, and it adheres to the heroic fantasy tone. Tone armor is largely defined by the preferences of the writer and the kind of story they want to tell, but sometimes it's also affected by outside factors, one of which is intended audience. The younger an audience for a story, the less likely that story is to expose its audience to certain kinds of danger or injury. It's not seen as appropriate, and while plenty of kids are super down with murder, certain kinds of body horror can stick with you if you aren't prepared for them, so they get glossed over or kept off screen or replaced with a more bloodless, non-lethal variant of the threat. Also, lots of stories for younger audiences skew more comedic, and in the interests of tonal consistency, if you're aiming for haha -ha comedy fun times, you probably don't want to interrupt the good times too much with visceral unpleasantness. Cartoon violence doesn't tend to overlap with haunting violence. There's also intended audience factors that have almost nothing to do with age and everything to do with genre. For instance, if you're writing some sort of romance, the only injury a character can likely expect is the kind that artfully lays them up in bed so their love interest can care for them without any messy side effects or complications. In this case, tone armor will keep the characters whole and pretty no matter what kind of horrible things they're going through because being pretty is kind of foundational to the genre and to the appeal to its audience. The other big outside factor that can affect tone armor is standards and practices. A lot of stories are affected by the presence of a distributor or an editor looking over the creator's shoulder and telling them things like, you can't show that on television. It's a form of moderate to severe censorship that is the trade-off many stories make in exchange for widespread distribution, and it very commonly manifests in hard limitations placed on the story's tone. For instance, it's very common for kids' TV shows to shy away from blood, which means characters might end a fight covered in anime scuff marks or bleed in unusual color to take the edge off, or only ever fight robots that bleed robot juice. In some cases, standards and practices might shy away from acknowledging death at all. This was weirdly common in 90s to 2000s anime dubs that had to take the source material and make it appropriate for an American Saturday morning time slot, which led to things like Yu-Gi-Oh's Shadow Realm, which exists in the original but gets much less screen time, because pretty much any time a character is in danger of being sent to the Shadow Realm in the dub, it's because the actual stakes were death. Death is not okay, but a horrifying death-like hell dimension is totes kid-friendly. And like, yes, that's objectively hilarious logic, but it's a form of tone armor that has a legitimate impact on how the story feels. Replacing buzz saws with dark energy discs that send you to the Shadow Realm if they touch you is very funny and very stupid, and I feel so bad for the team that had to paint over all those buzz saws and also erase my Valentine's cleavage in every shot, but it establishes boundaries on the story's tone that the standards and practices people thought were more in line with a Saturday morning time slot for kids. The lower bound on the tone is having your soul sent to a nightmare dimension where you would probably not have a good time but could potentially be rescued. It is not having your leg sliced off by a saw trap. Considerations like this are all in service to keeping the tone light, although some forms of censorship backfire and they frequently diminish the impact of parts of the story that are actually supposed to be notably dark. I don't want to keep beating up on Yu-Gi-Oh, but season four, the evil bikers from Atlantis and objectively the best season, featured villain characters with backstories like entire family died in a shipwreck and war orphan with dead little brother. And the dub kind of had to work overtime to change those to dude who got shipwrecked all by himself and turned his back on his family and little brother got kidnapped by a tank. Which makes the part at the end where they're heartwarmingly reunited with the ghosts of their dead families kind of a giant confusing plot hole. When a 
writer wants to write a story with deadly stakes, but is forced to adhere to a tone armor paradigm that refuses to even acknowledge the existence of death, the story can suffer and the characters might end up getting threatened with something that's even worse, but technically PG. Tone armor is an invisible paradigm established by a story that quietly teaches the audience what level of danger and brutality they can expect from the story. Most of the time, you will only think about tone armor when you see it break. And tone armor can break. In fact, breaking tone armor is one of the easiest ways to gut punch the audience, because it hits them in a way they didn't realize they could be hit. One of the most common and powerful ways tone armor can be broken is probably pretty obvious, because it's also a break in plot armor, killing a main character. Before a main character dies, the tone of the story passively indicates that this is impossible. Main characters are protected from danger by plot armor and general narrative importance. Death might not even be a concept in this story, except as a vague implied threat if the heroes fail to save the day, which they won't. And then something happens. Maybe they hit a season finale and have to do a boss rush to get to the final battle, and the big guy takes a hit and doesn't get back up. Maybe the new bad guy is such bad news that they straight up murder someone just to prove they can. Maybe the power-up that always saves the day gets cut off mid-theme music when the hero gets fully backstabbed. Something happens that has never happened before, and it changes the game. When a main character is built up for the express purpose of killing them off to show the stakes, this character is called a sacrificial lion. And despite their appearance as a standard main character, most of these characters are constructed specifically to die. It's just a matter of how well the writer can conceal this fact before the point of impact. And the thing is, while this is usually used to expand the lower bound of the story's tone and make it feel like anyone can die, it doesn't usually mean that anyone can actually permanently die now. Because again, plot armor exists for a reason. There was this really funny trend, it was funny to me anyway, in like the early 2010s where every popular show that was hitting the market was selling itself on the premise that anyone could die. Attack on Titan, Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead. I distinctly remember all these shows getting pitched as these dark, serious stories where being the main character wouldn't save you and that's what made it cool. And they all have a moment where someone central and important dies to prove that that's a thing that can happen. But the thing is, a story where anyone can actually die is a story where a lot of threads are gonna go unresolved, which is a bad story. <laughs> Like, if it leaves too many plot threads dangling, it's bad at being a story. So most of these stories end up outfitting their leads with a nice set of plot armor after a season or two, which I remember disappointing the people who'd been pitching them as dark, badass, anyone-can-die narratives. But like, that doesn't mean this form of breaking tone armor doesn't have an impact. It reshapes the feel of the world by proving that being central to the plot is not enough to protect a character. Before we see it happen, we don't believe it can happen. There are other ways tone armor can be broken without necessarily killing anyone. For instance, some Sometimes the tone of the story is secretly being carried by one character. One ridiculously overpowered protagonist who single-handedly makes the threats they deal with look easy, one very skilled and smart hero who keeps their villainous rival in check, one character who keeps the tone light and then the story gets rid of them. Maybe they're dead, maybe they're missing, maybe they're just yeeted out of the story for a while. Whatever happens, they aren't around to help anymore, and the rest of the characters have to deal with the stakes they leave behind. It turns out this character was doing a lot to keep things manageable, and without them essentially shielding the rest of the story, the dark parts of the plot get a lot darker. They do this in the Helsing OVAs, where Alucard is such a hilariously overpowered nightmare that in order to make the villains actually threatening, they lure him out and stick him on a boat for half the series, and while he's stuck on the boat, nearly everybody else dies when London is blitzkrieged by Nazi vampires. It's not the first time anyone dies in the show, but it's the first time the main characters end up in actual serious danger because they don't have their pocket eldritch abomination around to save the day. They also do this in ba -da -ba Reboot Season 3! As if I would get through this video without highlighting the tonal downturn that defined my childhood. The first two seasons of Reboot are goofy, mostly wacky episodic adventures with the occasional tonal whiplash in the form of a season finale or unusually devastating skills from the main villains. Then at the end of season two, trickster paragon protagonist Bob gets bundled into a rocket and fired into space, or rather the computer equivalent of space, the web, which is worse than space because it has Twitter in it. And without Bob, things get bad. Kid protagonist Enzo does his best to live up to his hero's example in single-handedly holding off these suddenly much bigger and scarier threats, and despite being a little kid and not a trained badass antiviral program, he holds it together decently well for a few episodes until he gets stuck in a Mortal Kombat game and loses his fucking eye in a show where the previous worst fate a hero could experience was a bad haircut. Things only get worse from there, with the kid heroes getting time skip training montaged into grown-ups while trapped in the games, and back home sees the destruction of basically every iconic location 
from the first two seasons, and the near-total victory of the Big Bad. And what makes this form of tone armor breakage work most effectively is that when the Vanished Shield character returns, things start getting good again. These characters are such powerful forces that they just make things better around them. And when the heroes find them or save them or they just make it back on their own, everything starts getting better in a way that didn't seem possible when they were gone. The tone of the story follows them. When they're gone, the villains can run rampant, but when they're around, the story can have a happy ending. And honestly, this is a remarkably effective way to make an otherwise kind of basic protagonist very impactful. If their presence in the story is what keeps the other characters safe, if their absence is what makes the story dip into tonal darkness that otherwise never happens, it's a very solid way to show Don't Tell how truly effective they are and how much they're doing for the story. One sneaky aspect of tone armor is that a lot of stories will threaten stakes that they would never actually pay off. This is extremely common in any sort of action setting where the implicit threat of main character death hangs over pretty much every combat encounter, or in stories where the villain's machinations threaten the end of the world as we know it. And while these are theoretical elements of the tone of the world because the story acknowledges them as possibilities, unlike, for instance, stories where death is not even acknowledged as a thing that can happen, they're kind of in a state of plausibility flux. The story recognizes that they are real threats, but never actually brings them into reality, so the audience doesn't necessarily buy them as part of the tone. A superhero story will threaten the apocalypse, but the mere existence of superheroes forestalls it from ever hitting, or in the worst case scenario, lasting longer than a week. In these cases, tone armor can be cracked with temporary forays into what-if scenarios, or more commonly, in-season finales or big crossover arcs, which is usually when the threats are allowed to get more present and real and the heroes switch from apocalypse prevention to apocalypse repair. These are odd little stakes cul-de-sacs where the story briefly gets a lot more perilous but then snaps back to normal, establishing that the story can get that dark but it won't stay that dark for long. This is how you can smoothly get unexpectedly dark single episodes of otherwise mostly lighthearted stories without it being ridiculously jarring. If the level of danger experienced in the one-shot Extreme Peril arc is in line with the level of danger threatened by the rest of the story, it's not completely story-breaking, it's just pleasantly tense. And that's kind of a narrow balance to strike. Tone armor is a mostly invisible element of storytelling that I frankly have never seen anyone directly discuss, but it plays a huge role in how stories feel and what a writer can do with them without dislodging or confusing their audience. Breaking a story's established tone armor is always an impactful moment. The first time we see a character bleed or break a bone or just straight up die is the first time the story proves it's willing to go there and could potentially go there again. But breaking the tone too violently risks relinquishing the story over into the joint custody of comedy and tragedy. Thus far, we've really only talked about stories that break their tone armor in relatively small ways, going from no blood to one drop of blood, or threatening Armageddon to taste-testing Armageddon, or this character has been successfully protecting us to the character's gone and the things they were protecting us from are actually really bad. Shifts that are one step outside the established tonal range. That's because if a story breaks its own tone armor by going from zero to a hundred, it's not darkly impactful, it's jarringly hilarious. Characters experiencing realistic consequences from cartoonish violence is a common dark joke. Genre bending lighthearted cartoon characters into dark and gory scenarios is used for instant shock factor. Everyone makes fun of the CW for taking colorful kids media and sexing it up for live action and whatever the hell else they did with Riverdale before they finally let it die, because that kind of shift is intrinsically funny. Everyone took the piss out of Sonic Forces when they dropped this little chestnut. Hell, just transposing wacky animated violence into the context of a live action adaptation can take a fight scene from feeling wacky to feeling uncomfortably visceral. When tone armor is broken, the first thing it does is make the audience feel unsafe. There was previously a narrow band of conceivable stakes that the story stayed within the boundaries of, and breaking the tone armor breaches those borders, and that means the audience no longer knows what to expect. The characters are in danger in a way they weren't before. That kind of subversion of expectations can be played up for tragedy, comedy, or both, but it can't be pushed too far if the intent is to keep the audience in the story. If you break the rules too hard, the audience gets jarred loose and stops being invested because they have no idea what to expect anymore. There's a reason it's inherently hilarious to consider where you would put a single F-bomb in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. No matter where it goes, it will never fit the tone. That's why it's funny. Trying to do it seriously would be like ice skating uphill. If you break the invisible rules that have been holding the story in shape this whole time, sometimes all the audience can do is laugh and then disinvest, because once the punchline is over, the audience leaves. So, yeah? I'll be honest, I've done some weird trope talks. This is probably the first one where I was like, man, I hope, I hope any of this makes sense. <laughs>